So now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. And I had the opportunity to have dinner with her last night, and so I'm really excited um, to introduce Hetty Chang. Uh, she's the founder and executive director of Attendance Works, which is a national and state level initiative aimed at advancing student success um, by addressing chronic absence. She's a skilled presenter, facilitator, researcher, and writer, and she co-authored the seminal report, Present, Engaged, and Accounted For, The Critical Importance of Addressing Chronic Absence in the Early Grades, as well as numerous other articles around student attendance. Um, deeply committed to promoting two-generation solutions to achieving a more just and equitable society, Hetty spent more than two decades working in the fields of family support, family economic success, education, and child development. She served as a Sigurd Program Officer at the Evelyn and Walter Haas Jr. Fund as a co-director of California Tomorrow, a nonprofit committed to drawing strength from cultural, linguistic, and racial diversity. In February 2013, Hetty was named by the White House as a champion of change for her commitment to furthering African American education. So please join me in welcoming Hetty Chang. Good morning. And so we now have my very first test, which is can I actually switch the technology to the right PowerPoint. Yay, I passed the first test. Um, good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here and to see what an amazing audience. Um, you know, I would love to just get a sense of who's in the room. How many of you are from K-12 education? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you are from a community partner that works with schools, that partners with schools? All right, philanthropy, United Way counts as part of that, family foundations, any researchers? All right, what a great group of folks. Let me ask another question. Um, it's just a question. How many of you guys have ever been on the Attendance Works website? A few, maybe about a third. Hopefully this will change by the end of this. Um, so let me just, a um, couple of things about Attendance Works. We are a giveaway strategy. We are a nonprofit initiative. And sometimes I think about, have you, how many of you have um, ever seen um, The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, Wizard of Oz. Remember when you go and you look at the wizard and you see this big um, like mask of this guy and then you open up the curtain and realize there's just one little guy back there? That's kind of like attendance works. Our website is like the mask, and then the kind of handful we've got, oh, seven, eight people, if you added us all together on a good day, that makes up attendance works. Um, we have moved chronic absence, when attendance works was started in 2010, to now to an actionable metric that's being used across the country. How did we get that way? It wasn't because of the few people who sit behind that little mask. In fact, when we started off, there was maybe one of us, if you added me and my communications person together. We got there because we have incredible allies and champions, some of whom are in this room, who are taking and using this work. Our website is our giveaway strategy to equip allies, people who believe in this work, to take this work and make it real in your own communities. What I will say is about 80% of anything you are going to try, someone tried something like it in another community. Getting kids to school is really, really not rocket science. We do have to use our data better, and we haven't been doing that. But you don't want, there's so much pressure on schools and communities these days. The thing you can't afford to do is reinvent the wheel. I will also guarantee you, if you start from scratch to put together something without taking the chance to learn from what didn't work in another place or what really worked in another place and then think about how you tailor it to the realities that only you all can know, you'll be too tired to tailor it to those realities. So please, use our website, <laughs> use our materials. Um, most of it is for free. There are a few things that you have to, and are easy to download. There are a few things you actually have to register and do more for because we're trying to actually ensure quality control. Um, we'll talk about some of those things, but please use um, our materials. I wanna, um, I, 
I think what I get the sense is that we have an audience that's pretty mixed. So I'm going to do a little bit of level setting. And if this feels um, a little bit repetitive to you, think about it this way. You can watch me do this, and hopefully what it helps you think about is how would you explain it to someone in your own community, OK? Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about attendance that still is pretty um, widespread. First of all, we're talking about this issue of chronic absence, which is missing so much school for any reason that a child is academically at risk. And I, we define that as 10%, partly because there's lots of research that shows that 10%, we definitely know kids are having challenges. I will tell you, it's not like a kid, let's say it's a 180-day school year, goes from 17 to 18, and all of a sudden, they went from an A to an F. That is not how it works, right? Each day gone is more of a problem. But if you use 10%, you'll notice just two days in the first month, four days in the second month, six days in the next month. So you can start to use prevention and early intervention as kids start to fall off track. And if you had done, let's say, uh, 5%, that's just one day a month, you'll over-identify too many kids. So the art of creating a metric is something that's easy to understand, that's actionable, and that's prevention-oriented. But what's really key is it's excused, unexcused, and suspensions. If we think that classroom instruction matters, the classroom experience matters, then not being in the classroom matters too. And it doesn't matter why they're gone. It's a cause for understanding what's going on. This is really different from truancy, which is usually only looking at unexcused absences, or average daily attendance, which is how many kids typically show up to school every day, which is what a, Missouri, like the state that I live in now, I actually grew up in Missouri, but I actually live in California now, so I always had average daily attendance in my life, <laughs> somewhere in there. Um, that's how many kids show up every day. Let me just show you something. Um, in theory, I will show you something. Um, this is looking at average daily attendance. And so if you look at this figure here in the green, that's actually Oakland, California. Um, when we helped them look at their data, and they looked at all the schools with 95% average daily attendance, they were seeing as high as 16%, sometimes even higher levels of chronic absence. The other school um, district is actually New York City, and they were looking at schools with 99%, and you were often seeing at least a fifth of their kids chronically absent. Imagine you have a school with 200 kids, right? 10 kids don't show up one day. That's 95% average daily attendance, right? 10 kids, 180 days, that's 1,800 absences. You could have 50 kids, each who missed 20 days, that's 1,000 absences, 25% chronic absence, and you still have 800 absences to spread among the other kids. It's a difference between saying how many kids typically show up every day to school versus how many kids are missing school so much that they're academically at risk. And you actually have to add up from individual kids' data to figure it out. Average daily attendance does not tell you how many kids might be missing so much school that they're academically at risk. Now, this is uh, my own school district of San Francisco Unified when I first got them, by the way, um, we'll hear about, one thing is this stuff takes persistence over time. I'm still working with my own school district. The first time I got them was, what, eight years ago to actually look at their data? Turn to the person next to you for a moment. And I want you to think about what do you see? The red line, by the way, is the kids who were chronically absent, and the black line were the number of kids who would have had 10 unexcused absences. I think your trigger for truancy is eight days. So they would have well been in that mark of, being identified um, as being truant. Um, and this would have uh, had a habitual truancy, in, at least in California. So when you think about those two lines, turn to the person next to you. What do you see? What do you see as differences? What do you see as similarities? What do you see? Turn to the person next to you. Bikes when you go to high school. At that ninth grade, that's a killer one, right? But also, it's high in the beginning, right? But what you notice about the beginning is if you had just looked at the kids who were truant, you would have missed half 
the kids, right? I also want to share another little uh, secret about California, because we have fun based on average daily attendance. According to California state law, when kids, if you are tracking by period attendance, as long as a child shows up for one period, you get to count them as there. Is that true for Missouri too? No. In our, well in our case, depending on what your definition is, okay? So as long as they showed up one period, they were counted as there in middle school. Every single California district that I've ever been in, it all of a sudden looks like we figured out chronic absence in middle school. I don't think so. When my district calculated using 10% of periods missed, and you guys can do that 10% of hours because of how you look at it in uh, Missouri, that number went up 30%. Now, for the purposes of average daily attendance funding, I'm actually not interested in my school district losing money. <laughs> but for the purposes of an early warning system, it's not the right metric. So sometimes we have to distinguish what's the metric we're using for, and then how do we need to calculate it. And it also suggests one of the first things you do when you look at data is say, look right, feel right, doesn't quite seem right, let's, let's unpack a little. How are we tracking this data and how are we being used? By the way, the stuff at the end a lot of times has to do, we see this less at the state level, more at the district level. A lot of times if kids are dropping out of high school, you see weird patterns at the end because the kids with the worst attendance start um, being lost from the system. So one other reason why we often miss this is because absences aren't consecutive. They're sporadic. One day, one week, one day, the next week. Teachers and families, we all don't quite see it. So I'm going to do a little exercise. Can I get, hmm, we'll figure this out. Can I get three people to volunteer? I promise. <laughs> I won't, just three people over here. Yay, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Tanae, and thank you, Stevie. All right, Stevie, we're going to, OK, we'll have you all. Stevie, why don't you stand here? Tanae, you're going to go here. And Wendy, you're going to go here, but I'm going to ask you to be very careful, OK, because you're going to have to do a little backwards stepping. But Stevie, Tanae, and Wendy, Wendy are all five years old. This is their first day of kindergarten. Yay! But Wendy, she lived in this public housing complex. Her family was sort of not so connected to supports and resources. So even though you guys had lobbied hard, got this great full day pre-K program going, Wendy didn't know anything about it when it started. So the year before kindergarten, she didn't get any of that great extra energy. Can you take eight steps back, but just be very careful when you get to the, um, yeah, you can step up or great. Now, today was in that same housing complex, but her family just, someone reached out, got her a little more connected. You went for the first couple of months and then Dad's car broke down, had lots of challenges, and there was actually a waiting list for this great pre-K program. So then they're like, you know, maybe this isn't such a good fit. So you ended up actually leaving the program. So can you take four steps back um, to represent, you got kind of only partial benefit, but Stevie here, Stevie's doing great, he's excited. And then, you know what, because Kansas City Public, School, City Public Schools has been um, really investing in high quality kindergarten teaching, you all got a great high quality kindergarten teacher. Stevie, take eight steps forward, it's going this way, and tonight you get to each take the same eight steps forward because you all were with this great high quality kindergarten teacher. But you know, Wendy, so have you guys ever been in a kindergarten class where some of the kids have never been with anyone other than their family member all their five years of life? Right? It's a little loud, a little screamy, right? Kids are a little clingy. 
Now, the other thing was one of the reasons why Wendy's mom was sort of nervous about putting her in pre-K was actually you, your housing was kind of substandard. She was actually worried you had asthma. But you noticed something. Either whether you went, I got a stomach ache, or you went, <coughs> mom, he's like, oh, Wendy needs to stay home with me, my poor baby. And so you missed a lot of kindergarten. So you missed like about on, you were what we would call severely chronically absent. You missed about the equivalent of two months total of school, about at least four days a month of school. And then it wasn't just, so take two steps back for each month that you missed. And it wasn't just the day that you missed, it was also the day you came back. Because the instructions had been given the day before. And then the group project was going, all the kids were into it, and you would just kind of stand by the side and go, huh? What's going on? So you'll have to take two more steps. Now, Tanae didn't have quite some of those health issues, but God, that transportation was still kicking, you know, making it easy, not very hard, making it hard and not easy to get to school. And your family didn't have a whole lot of supports helping you, and so you missed about a month of school. So take a step back for the month you missed and another step back for the day that you were back but didn't know what was going on. Now Stevie, though, he's excited, he's in class, and you know what happened? because you have had an amazing local grade level reading campaign, really working with the libraries, really putting in books. You saw that program in the library, and Steve, you're like to your mom, I want to go. I, and you would go all that summer reading more books, picking up books when you could from the book giveaways. And so you know what? By the time you got to first grade, you were a month ahead. Take a step forward. Now. Wendy here, she saw that, she kind of saw that program in the library, but she wasn't feeling so comfortable around books. She was already noticing that all these other kids were doing stuff, reading better than she was. And she's like, yeah, I don't think so. I don't want to be embarrassed more. So have you all heard of summer learning loss? It can cool about two more months of school. So can you take two steps back? Those, so she arrived back in first grade even farther behind than in kindergarten. Now, today here, she, she tried a little, but those transportation issues, they still kept getting you every time. Take just one more step back. All right. If nothing interrupts this cycle, who's reading by the end of third grade? Phoebe. Not sure. And for sure, <laughs> Wendy's got a huge challenge. Huge round of applause for our volunteers here. So by the way, this exercise you can use any time. You can use it with parents. You can use it with policymakers. It helps people kind of see what happens, particularly for our youngest, most vulnerable kids. And if you want to. Um, Go to our Bringing Attendance Home Toolkit. You got instructions, and then you can ad lib as you get more comfortable with it. This is the data on kids in Chicago public schools. They're all low income kids. For those of you who would prefer chart versions, <laughs> research, University of Chicago style research, the kids that were the work, this here is the Dibble scores for the kids who are chronically absent in pre-K, K, first, and second grade. They need intensive intervention by the end of second grade. This here, green, those are the kids, all low-income kids, who were not chronically absent in any of those years. You don't benefit from a high-quality learning program unless you're there, right? This isn't rocket science. We just needed data to further show this. So whether you want to do it by the uh, walking back and forth, or you want to do it through research, we know attendance matters. Now, in Rhode Island, they didn't go back to pre-K. They didn't have that. But they were able to look at kindergarten through seventh grade data. 
What they found was that chronic absence in kindergarten predicted lower le levels of literacy in first grade and lower achievement as you went out, and the gap grew over time. So think about it this. Kids chronically absent in pre-K and K. Third grade, they still show up. And actually, in third grade, the health issues tend to decrease a little. Kids can also walk a little more on their own, so they're less subject to some of the transportation issues. But you can show up in third grade. You're no longer chronically absent and still fall behind because you can't read. So you're sitting in that classroom falling behind even though you are physically present. And then it starts to grow. Now, by middle school, how many of you guys have had a middle school child? Have a middle school child? At least for my middle school child, that was when the idea was you get out, you get on the bus, and you get to school on your own, or you walk on your own. And I, as a parent, am going to trust that I watched you leave the front door, and you are going to get to school. Now, if school's a really negative experience, it is harder to trust that they go from front door to school, right? What they found was that by middle school, kids predicted, it predicted higher levels of chronic absence, and it actually predicted suspensions in middle school. What happens when kids in middle school can't keep up with what's happening in the classroom, don't feel connected, feel embarrassed maybe because they're behind? They act out, right? because they're not engaged, or maybe it's easier to act out than admit that you don't know what's going on. Now, this is data from Utah. They looked at chronic absence between 8th through 12th grade. By the time, but, so I will say, when kids are younger, the impact of chronic absence is a bit greater on low-income kids, okay? Because in elementary years, families have easier ways of making up for the reading and literacy um, Upper income families have easier ways for making up. Um, but lower income families, let's say for parents who may them, maybe themselves are low income because they themselves aren't literate, the consequences of not being in a literacy rich environment are much greater. But by the time you get to middle and high school, how many of you guys have had a middle or high school child? It gets really scaffolded, right? And even those of us, like I swear I passed geometry, but when I looked at my kids' geometry homework, I didn't really understand what he was doing. Either I forgot it or they're doing something that I don't ever remember doing. Um, and then when I watched my husband try to tutor my child, I thought, mm, not good. You know? <laughs> um, so by the time in middle and high school, you're actually, de it's pretty scaffolded. Kids need to be in the class to learn from the teacher. And when they're chronically absent, you really see impacts. Because the biggest predictor of not passing course grades, starting in middle and high school, is chronic absence. In fact, Chicago data actually shows that attendance was a better predictor of ninth grade performance than eighth grade test scores. It's about that showing up to learn habit that you need to gain. And by the way, all kids need to gain. What they found in Utah, this was a cross class, that if kids missed one year, anywhere between eighth to twelfth grade, they were a third more likely to drop out. Two years and half of them were dropping out. We collect this data every single day. Unlike test scores, you don't have to wait. You know as soon as a kid enters class or doesn't show up, whether a kid is starting to be chronically absent. We have almost no other education metric that we collect on such a consistent basis, which would allow us to take easy action. And again, vulnerable kids are affected most. They are less likely to have the resources to make up for the time on task, but they're also more likely to face the systemic barriers that mean they're chronically absent not just one year, but multiple years. When a kid misses class, though, it has ripple effects. It affects the other kids who are relying on group projects. It affects the teachers, it affects the whole school. Um, how many of you guys looked in your packet and saw this great report that the United Way put together? And this has your local data. And one of the things that struck me, not that, um, was this graph. This is on page three. And I know it's average daily attendance. But what it showed was that the higher your attendance rate, the higher your graduation rate. Right? 
We actually looked just at chronic absence in California, and we found the higher chronic absence, the lower the graduation rate, and the lower the kids in high schools who were taking college-bound courses. When you have high levels of churn, it affects the entire school. It's not just the kids who are chronically absent, whose education is actually affected. And this is why it's in all of our interests to improve attendance. I also will say, any business folks in the room? A few, yay. We should, we'll expand that. I know United Way can help bring this. But this is a key issue for our local economy. You want a future workforce? You got to have kids who are educated, right? But it's also a soft skills issue. A key indicator of whether it's, you know, what people look for. What all of us find is that when we go to, we got to show up to work, right? And even if it's an online existence, you've got to show up when you were expected to show up on time. You've got to deliver on time. The other thing is it's a, even a current workforce issue, because when little kids are sick, guess where their parents are not? What we're really trying to do as a country is shift from a paradigm that has been focused on truancy which has really been focused on the issue of compliance. Truancy was about, you need to comply with our compulsory education laws, which say you should be in school. Or you need to give this data because this is how we're going to fund you. That's compliance. Not that compliance is, it's not necessarily bad, it's just not sufficient. And typically, it's looked at individuals, and it's looked at more legal solutions. It's the nasty letters. You don't show up to school, eventually we're going to threaten you with court. But it happens late in the game, late after habits are already formed. What we want to do is move to chronic absence because we're looking at all absences. It's actually a different conversation with parents. Let's say if today, if you're in a truancy conversation, I said to your mom, today miss school, and your mom says, oh, but we had a good excuse. This has happened. That's the wrong conversation. Tanae missed school. When she missed school, she missed out on this incredibly important math lesson. What are we going to do? How are we going to make sure she makes up? That's the right conversation. I don't, on some level, really care whether she's got a good excuse or not. I want Tanae to learn. And I actually think it's a better conversation to have parents, because parents have hopes and dreams. And then you're applying to that, not trying to figure out if they can find a doctor's note to get the right excuse. It's about taking prevention, problem-solving approaches. It's actually being trauma-informed. So, you know, there is research now that shows, it, it falls into what I call the the research, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we have to prove by research that you would know from common sense. But it is good to have research to back it up. So I had colleagues of mine who were, um, uh, I said, we really need research showing the connection between ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. Have, how many of you heard of heard of ACEs? And it, more ACEs kids have, the more health challenges, more other kinds of issues. Well, it turns out, more ACEs kids have, the higher likelihood of chronic absence. Three or more ACEs, you were more likely to be chronically absent. One ACE is connected to violence in the community, and you were more likely to be chronically absent. But you know, when kids have experienced trauma, the key thing is not to say what's wrong with you. It actually re-traumatizes kids, right? The key is to say, what happened to you, and how can I help? If we know chronic absence is connected to trauma, we have to transform the way our schools have historic, this is across the country, this is not just Missouri. Across the country have taken a truancy kind of much more legal and much more punitive approach to using chronic absence as an early sign that we need engagement, we need support, and this data will help us figure out where we can do that most. So I want you to turn to a person next to you again. Start with this first question. Think about a kid who you know who struggles to get to school, and just say what some of those things are. Turn to the person next to you. I'm going to start on this side. What are some of the things? What are some of the things that people 
He saw his barriers that kids face. Transportation. Transportation. Homelessness. Babysitting. Babysitting. Family responsibilities. Absolutely. Health. Health. Kids Mobility. Mobility is a huge issue. Other thoughts over here? Bullying. Bullying. Latch key. So we've found that it's helpful to bucket the reasons why kids miss school into these kind of larger categories. There's these barriers. Some of them were coming up, the health issues, the family responsibilities, trauma, poor transportation, mobility. And those, I will say, tend to happen a lot um, starting outside of school, right? They're existing in a community. And, and one of the things I think that is really hard um, is that those challenges feel like they're growing for our high poverty families. Um, so even uh, the, the work on chronic absence is more important than ever before, but those are, both, those are huge issues. But then there's also, and someone said bullying, the negative school experiences, right? If what happens in school is negative because um, there's bullying or you have not very good school discipline practices, and kids are being suspended for unfair reasons. Kids may not only miss the day they were suspended, they may not come the day they came back. Or let's say, this can also happen, parents had awful experiences in school, and they're actually worried about what their kids are going to face. The, you'll see some reluctance on that, and you're going to have to know that to work through that. Let me just give a quick example of um, when you know that. in. Um, one of the groups that has the highest levels of chronic absence in the country is Native American kids. But if you think about the history of how Native American kids have been treating, treated by mainstream schools, it is not a pretty one, right? Schools were used to strip them of their language, their culture, literally rip them apart from their families and communities. So Native Americans, this, was, this is not long from their memory, um, not that it's always true, but generally true, and in, um, but in Oregon, the tribes realized that chronic absence was a big issue, and the tribal governments lobbied the Oregon State Legislature to set aside funding to create a tribal attendance pilot project. They then worked so that the tribes don't actually run their schools. It's run by um, other schools right off the reservation. Um, and in those cases, they would work together to bring in a case manager who they both jointly essentially agreed upon who could serve as a bridge and create a tiered support system. The, one of the things they had to do, for example, in some of the schools was make sure that language, even about the attendance, was actually in the, tri in the native language. Because you had to visibly show, no, this isn't going to be the same experience as what you had. You had to combat that negative experience. And by the way, Oregon as a state has had increased chronic absence, but Native American kids in Oregon are having less chronic absence. Where you invest in this, it makes a difference. In any case, negative school experiences, the lack of engagement, whether or not your school, this is why some of those career pathway, the high school stuff is so important, because it helps kids show you know, what's a pathway to future connect, the relevance. But when school doesn't feel relevant, kids don't feel motivated, engaged to show up, or if the school climate is itself really unwelcoming. And by the way, that ninth grade, tenth grade thing that you see, that we saw that earlier in the San Francisco data, another reason why that happens to get higher is you've got kids who should be in tenth grade, who didn't pass enough classes, are now in ninth grade, and now they're feeling like, I don't know if this is actually going to happen for me. And then there are the misconceptions which is why people have really started moving into these attendance campaigns. Just two days a month can throw you off track, particularly for the younger kids. This is important, but I also want you to know, I think the messaging has to be done within the context of these other issues. If you have families who they aren't getting to school because it's a, not a safe path, you can't just say get to school because they're worried about something bigger. Right? If a kid has asthma, you actually have to assure the family you know what they're, what's happening around asthma and you can help, or you're going to reduce triggers for asthma in the school or in the home. While you're saying, you know, 
even if kids miss absences and they're excused, you miss out on lost learning time, which is why we have to address this barrier. So you can combine barrier reduction with messaging, but particularly for families who are struggling, you can't just do messaging and expect they're gonna somehow overcome these challenges. We talk about the fact that um, kids get to school, families get to school, when they have hope, faith, capacity. Hope for a different future. Faith that the school will get them there and capacity. And now I realize that I just forgot to do that second part of the exercise, which is what helps you get to school? I'm going to try it now. What helps a child, that same child you're thinking about, get to school even when it's tough? Turn to the person next to you. This is a quick, a quick one. What are some of the things? What helps kids get to school? When relationships. Relationships. I'm going to actually just stick with that one for a moment. Relationships are key. What gives you hope in yourself? And since Tanae's here, she's like my welcome, my, 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 my partner here. If Tanae was discouraged about coming to school, because let's say she's seen challenges in the community around her, one of the key things that will help Tanae have faith, is if I say, Tanae, man, you are amazing. You have a bright future ahead of you, right? Even when we lose faith in ourselves or hope in ourselves, someone who knows us and cares about us and reminds us of our strengths and that we can succeed, this is true for us still as adults, right? But it's especially true for kids. Hope, that gives us hope. And when a teacher or someone in the school does that, it gives a child faith that someone in that school is rooting for them. And when kids have faith in their school and the people there, hope for their future, you can actually help them with capacity. And if there's a challenge, that child is going to be more likely, or family is going to be more likely to tell the school what's going on so you can actually help address whatever the capacity issue is. This is really about a tiered approach. Most schools have some kind of tiered approach. By the way, this is not about, if you're doing, how many of you guys are doing PBIS? Some version, RTI, these are all our wonderful school acronyms. If you're not from schools and don't worry about it, you'll figure it out. It's, some, it's a public health approach. What I would just say is, I'm not suggesting you create a new tiered approach. I'm asking that you look at the data you use for whatever tiered approach you are and make sure you're looking at chronic absence and attendance data and using it as part of it and you're integrating this into it. We can't have a gazillion tiered approaches with a different committee for every tier, type of approach. It's the same committee taking a deeper look at how this, um, how this data works. But what I would say is we've actually started to flip the pyramid. Because what I want people to know is you need tier one and then tier two in order to prevent kids from being in tier three. When you have high levels of chronic absence, it means you don't have sufficient tier one and tier two in place. And if you have high levels for a particular population, like African-American kids, maybe all the other kids feel welcome and engaged in the school, but that group of kids is not. And we'll have to take a hard look at it. When you have high levels of, and if you have an entire school with high levels of chronic absence, maybe the structure of that school is not working for any kid in that building. This is why you also want community partners. Because when the levels get too high, you might need to have help to improve the conditions. You know, if it's a small number of kids, a, student, a small student support group can help it. If it's bigger, everyone in the entire school is going to have to help. And then if it's even bigger than that, you might need community partners so you can put in place those tier one and tier two supports. This is what we call taking a data-driven systemic approach that has You've got shared accountability. You guys have shared accountability. You've had the 90-90 rule for a long time. You've also got your state ESSA plan. But now we're moving to much more actionable data because just end of the year data doesn't, is not actionable. End of the year data doesn't allow you to take preventive action. But then the preventive action, that's where we have to build capacity because you need positive engagement so that they can take, make that shift from truancy to chronic absence and a positive problem-solving approach. And then you can use this data to figure out where you need strategic partnerships. 
Chronic absence, again, just going back at this um, report, there's a little graph that talks about about 14% of your schools in the area in Kansas City, 20% or more levels of chronic absence. 29%, you have 11 to 20, um, have between 11 and 20% levels. And then you have 10% or less. Those 14% might need extra supports. When you look at that 11 to 20%, you might want to look at is it particular subpopulations that are affected. Maybe for those subpopulations, you really need community partners who know how to reach those subpopulations. This data allows you to take preventive action and think about where you can, because the good news is chronic absence isn't everywhere. By the way, do you all know what the best predictor of chronic absence is? Anyone? They're like, it's a trick question. Okay, the best predictor of chronic absence is chronic absence. I'm saying this because any group, even among Native American kids who I said were disproportionately, the majority still are not chronically absent. You can't use race, you can't use poverty, you can't use neighborhood to know a kid's gonna be chronically absent. Families are creative, students are creative. But if a child was chronically absent the prior year, pretty good chance they're gonna be chronically absent again. If the child has chronic absence the first month of school, pretty good chance they're gonna to continue to be so. You use data to identify where you use the sports. And then you can use data to think about what kind of community partners might help you tailor the response to that population. But you never wanna to go to stereotyping. You always wanna use data to figure out who you wanna support. Yep. Mobility is a huge predictor. But I will say that, um, so the data, um, so uh, like Tulsa, they found that kids who had uh, shifted schools the year before was a big issue. In Baltimore, when they looked at mobility, they found two kinds of situations. There were some kids who were moving out of district and they were actually moving to a better life. And that one-time mobility to a better school did not predict chronic absence. But if you're two or three times, especially in the same school year, that's probably a predictor that you're actually having housing issues. Huge predictor of chronic absence. Transition years are always uh, tougher, but it's the entry into elementary. And then it, it kind of depends on what supports you have in place. People who have really good transition plans in place between into middle and to ninth grade have lower levels of chronic absence. It's, it's, it's whether or not you're supporting kids through the transition. But looking at the transition, often that's where you see spikes. Absolutely. Um, so this is a shift from attendance equals compliance to attendance equals opportunity to learn. And this is about being an action alert. So I'm going to talk about a couple things. One is that ultimately, it's a school site level where this has to have capacity, okay? Because if you can't change what happens when kids and families walk through the door at a school site, you won't change attendance patterns. And you need some kind of team. And I put it in quotes because I'm not always sure it's an attendance team. It could be, and this is where you have to think about um, who can fulfill these functions. These are the four functions I want you to have in place at a school site level. And I believe it's going to be administrators have to figure out how to, where it could be one team, it could be divided among two teams, like you have a PBIS team and then another attendance team. Somebody has to monitor the data to understand which groups of kids are most affected. Someone has to be also trying to figure out what are the causes, because if you have common causes, you need a group intervention. Not everything is case management. Let's say it's all these kids from this one neighborhood that don't have a safe path to school. Figure out the safe path, don't just case manage every single one of the individual kids. You know, look at, sometimes you will see chronic absence and they are concentrated in a classroom. And then you have to take a hard look at what's happening in the classroom. Now I've seen different things. One time I looked at that and the principal said, yeah, we got mold in that classroom. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Another time it was long-term subs. Teacher was on maternity leave. Another time it was a kid who was having behavioral issues. Teacher couldn't manage it and all the other kids kept calling in sick. And other times, 
I've seen. It's teachers who somehow, I believe, by the way, most teachers are great. They should be in there. And there are some teachers who they are just, they're tired. They're bo and they are not engaging teachers, and kids are walking with their feet. And then you've got to figure out, as a, and this is the hardest part of administrator's job, what to do with that teacher, right? But that's why you look at the data, you figure out where it exists, you start to explore what are the causes, you got to develop and enlist a support for a school-wide strategy, and you got to make sure that you're having triage for the kids who have tier two, tier two and tier three kids. So again, you can figure out, and we can make these slides available, by the way. I'm happy to do that. Here's the kinds of folks who can be on your attendance team. This may not even be all of them. I also want to make sure that you think just like with any other teams, you got to have good group practice. You got to figure out your norms, regularly scheduled meetings, responsibility. Usually you need to have a facilitator, someone who's getting the data, and someone who's taking notes to remind people on everything that they decided they do at that meeting so they don't forget in all our busy schedules. There are these different agenda items, aggregate data and tier one strategies, by the way. I want to offer up those two strategies. You can have kids, families, community partners part of the conversation. Don't limit who's in your team. That's not confidential information. When you get to early warning systems, tier two and tier three kids, and you're actually talking about kids and you are saying their names, then you need to have confidentiality. And you'll have to be thinking about it. But sometimes people get so worried about these things that they forget to involve community partners, even kids. You can have kids explore causes of chronic absence. And by the time they're kind of even like fifth, sixth grade, these kids want agency. You get, you know, you get them involved, they'll help you solve problems. And one of the things we encourage teams to do is to fill out a pyramid. And you think about how many kids you have at each level. And then, do I have enough supports? Where are the gaps in supports? You can even leverage parent-teacher conferences. So a lot of this is about figuring out ways that you take what you're doing in a school and make sure that you're adding attendance into it. So you can use your parent-teacher conferences so at every level you're con congratulating, you're expressing concern, or if you need the social worker or other people to help with the deeper kids. But that means you know which kids are chronically absent and what the levels are before you go into parent-teacher conferences and you've equipped teachers to be able to say something about it. I do think it should be said in every parent-teacher conference because this is, that's the universal so that every, doesn't, kids don't feel singled out. They recognize this is just about an expectation that we have for all our kids. And I will also suggest that one of the things you really want to think about, the kids that get overlooked, but for whom we could get the biggest accountability benefit are the kids who are borderline, at risk, or have moderate levels of chronic absence. Because these are the kids who you can turn the attendance around within a single school year, right? You only have a single school year to change your school accountability metrics. If a kid was severely chronically absent, missed 60 days, you get them down to 30 days, that's good. They're still chronically absent. The severely chronically absent kids, I think we're going to have to come up with a different measure. We're going to have to look at decreased absences. But this group of kids, the challenge is that this group of kids that are moderately are the ones that have typically fallen off our radar screen because they're not crying out so loud for help. These kids we notice. These kids we don't, or often don't. And there is lots of tier two interventions that can help. Again, this is about using the data. You can think about caring mentors. Cheryl's a great resource for that. We can talk about student attendance success plans. It's something you can find on our website. Engaging before and after school activities. Don't just have after school be first come, first serve. Make sure the kids who need the most engagement get into those after school programs. Walk to school companions. Build it into your IEPs, into your, the way in which you're supporting your kids in special ed. Special kids in special ed are more likely to be chronically absent. You've got to understand their particular needs. Think about the kids who have health issues and how you're, you're going to have health plans. So here are the pitfalls. You don't want to just focus on the kids with the most absences. You don't want to just use case management because it won't get you to strategies at scale. 
You don't have too small of a team because you don't have enough resources to do the work. And don't forget to rally the whole school for support. I'm going to show you something. Um, this is about teaching attendance. Um, we have, has anyone been on our teaching attendance online modules? Yay, a few. This was our effort when we realized that we couldn't get cloning and we had to figure out how to go to scale because we went from two states with chronic absence as an accountability metric to 37, well, 36 plus Washington, D.C., and actually all states in the country now have chronic absence are supposed to in their school report cards. This was our effort to make sure that there was something people could see. These are online modules that if you register, um, you can get access to them and you can give your entire faculty, everyone, access to them. Um, they give school leaders a quick way to equip teachers and school staff or even community partners. Um, it, get, it tries to get people to think about prevention, early intervention. We have three modules, why we teach attention, um, creating a culture of attendance, using data for early intervention and support, and they summarize key concepts. I'm going to run this quickly through. I'm actually going to come back possibly at lunchtime and I'll show you a little bit of this, but I know I'm going to run out of time this morning. Um, but they do things like help teachers think about what were their positive experiences, what were their negative experiences, and then get them to think about, well, what does that mean for your own school? I think teachers sometimes forget the power, teachers and other school staff that they have in the life of a kid. What they say really matters. Um, and we also do something called attendance dips. You can actually look at um, map data. This is average daily attendance in New York City. It's almost like an EKG. And you can see places where you have dips. And then you can understand where those dips are occurring. And by the way, the highest poverty schools tend to have the big worst dips. But this is another way that you can structure your tier one interventions. Or sometimes it's like one of the things that typically has an attendance dip is half days. Half day professional development, half day parent teacher conferences is when kids don't come to school. There's something kind of ironic in that. So maybe you want to think about um, what does that mean about how you structure those kinds of things? And I want to do something just because um, I, know, well, I, know, I know I don't have too much time, but I want to actually um, show you the story of another story of, of another community. And let me see if I can make this work. Um, all right, one more try. Missing a day of school here, two days there, may not seem like a big deal. <laughs> but before long, those days add up, and students aren't learning, and they're struggling to keep up academically. Seven million children in the U.S. are considered chronically absent. That means missing 10% of the school year. States are beginning to take the problem seriously. For the last few years, schools in Cleveland, Ohio, have made a big effort to encourage students to get to class every day. Special correspondent Kavita Cardoza with our partner Education Week found steady progress there, but also a long way to go. For our weekly segment, Making the Grade. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's dark, cold, and snowing. The kind of day when it's difficult to get out the door. Snow is real hard. But Amanda Watkins prides herself on her daughter's perfect school attendance. I can't miss a day. It's my perfect attendance, not even hers. In Cleveland Public Schools, though, that kind of attendance record is not typical. A couple of years ago, school system leaders found more than half their 40,000 students were chronically absent. The problem starts as early as kindergarten. Principal Brittany Anderson at Patrick Henry School greets every child as they come in and yeah, their parents. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you all for making sure they're safe. A lot of parents expressed that they didn't feel welcome in the school in prior years. So once a week, she sets out coffee and pastries. And at first, it was just a way to get them in. But then the coffee clubs turned into a way for the parents to talk to the teachers. That way, we can have these conversations with our parents without it feeling formal. <laughs> Diamond Godomsky has three kids in the school. She appreciates the warm welcome. When, you know, you come in and you see smiling, friendly faces with stuff to give to you, hot treats or whatever, you know, it makes you feel good. All right, SPO meeting tomorrow. Anderson says building good relationships relationships with parents makes it more likely they'll bring their children to school, even on a day like today. If our scholars are not here, then they're not learning. Students who miss a lot of school are more likely to drop out. 
Robert Balfance, a researcher with Johns Hopkins University, found a direct link between attendance and academics in Florida. And essentially, we found that each additional day of missed schooling, students had one fewer point on the state test. So miss 10 days, lose 10 points, miss 15 days, lose 15 points. But because schools used to track attendance differently, Balfan says until recently states didn't even realize there was a problem. Traditionally schools have measured average daily attendance, which is how many kids on average are in the building on a given day. And except in the most extreme cases, that's almost always in the 90s. And we're hardwired to think 90A, good. But it turns out that you could have average daily attendance in the low 90s and still have a quarter of your kids missing a month or more of school. Chronic absenteeism affects all students, says Hedy Chang with the nonprofit Attendance Works. A teacher now is faced with the choice of repeating lessons or keeping going on for the kids who have been there. And that churn slows down the ability of the entire classroom to move forward. A new federal education law signed into effect by former President Barack Obama goes into effect this year. Now, all states will be required to track chronic absenteeism. It's typically considered missing 18 school days or more. But Cleveland leaders found even missing one day a month made a difference. So they started a public relations blitz. The slogan, get to school, you can make it, was on billboards, posters, magnets, t-shirts, even grocery store bags. Everyone helped staff a daily phone bank. Board members, principals, bus drivers, they made 16,000 calls the first the reason, year. The reason for the call is Jalen has missed four more days of school and good attendance helps. Keisha Bullard is a kindergarten teacher. Is there anything that we can do to assist you? In the past hour, for instance, I think that I've dialed maybe 20 numbers, 30 numbers. Low-income families in particular face many challenges. With the weather being like it is, is asthma. Most of the time it is transportation or illness issues. Lori Hobson, who's in charge of attendance for the district, found lots of kids miss school simply because they don't have clean clothes. We provide uniforms to any family who needs a uniform. And what we discovered was attendance improves for as much as six weeks after receiving a uniform. Cleveland schools partner with several organizations to help provide families with everything from a bus pass to emergency shelter to legal help. This makes sense, Chang says, because the school district can't solve deeper social problems on its own. When you have high levels of chronic absence, often it means that there are these bigger challenges, and you really need to have a community approach to address it. In Cleveland, it's an all-out effort. A community college offers scholarships as incentive, local businesses check attendance before hiring, and the Cleveland Browns players visit schools regularly. Whenever you're late, that means you don't have respect for the other person's time. And then until you get fined, so if I think our fine, if you miss a meeting, might be like $10,000. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We have a full agenda, so I'm not going to... Some districts do use punishments, and, uh, such as fines, jail time, time, and taking right away driver's licenses. But Cleveland schools have found focusing on positive messages far more effective. We show up every day and so should Cleveland students, even when it's cold outside. Get to school, Cleveland. We know you can make it. In the last two years, Cleveland's chronic absenteeism rate has dropped from 50 to 30%. At Cleveland High School for Digital Arts, Principal Jasmine Mays and a local radio celebrity are hosting a surprise celebration because students have made their attendance goal. You never know when DJ Incognito is going to show up and just come and throw us a party. <laughs> Ninth grade is another year when students are most likely to miss school, but today everyone is glad they're here. That's actually the icing on the cake, Z107.9 being here. Oh, it's cool because it brings everybody together, you know, like it's something unexpected. I think it motivates kids to, to come to school because they don't want to miss school stuff like this. Eric Gordon is the CEO of Cleveland Schools. He says they've moved from rewarding perfect attendance to recognizing students who come to school regularly. Someone watching might say, really, a party 
just for coming to school? Like, isn't that what kids are supposed to do? Well, yes, it is what kids are supposed to do. Um, I would challenge people to look at their own workplace environments, though, where uh, companies give bonuses for all kinds of things, including high attendance, where they have parties for their uh, staff for performing well. I mean, incentive is part of how you create behaviors. In Cleveland, thousands more children now attend classes regularly. But a third of the district is still missing 18 days or more of school. And Gordon says it will continue to take a lot of effort. For PBS NewsHour and Education Week, I'm Kavita Kaduza in Cleveland, Ohio. So we are going to have all day to continue thinking about this. I'm hoping that those ideas that you just talked about, you're going to keep it in mind. I'm also going to be here. I'm also going to be part of the lunch panel. We can continue to have a dialogue, continue. I'm, I'm staying here all the way till the end of the day. So um, I think that we can use the lunch session to also get um, questions out. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn it to Mike to take it for the next part of your agenda.